Amen. Thank you, Truett. Thank you, ladies, for that. It is uh, good to be able to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be able to deal with the Word of God and understand that uh, He loves us so much that He actually speaks to us. He gives us His Word. He lets us know who He is. He lets us know who we are as compared to who He is. And He lets us know what the proper response should be by us to Him and who He is. And that is a glorious thing. It's a wonderful thing to think about. He didn't just leave us floating aimlessly in, in the void, if you will. We are not uh, the worshipers of a God who is a, a, like the deist God uh, that so many really worship in their own, uh, their own way. The deist God is a God who creates and then just steps back out of creation and lets everything happen as it will, as if it's by chance. But the God of creation is not that way. The God of creation creates and then he acts in this creation and he works in the lives of those whom he has created and he draws people unto himself and he brings salvation and it's a glorious, glorious thing. He lets us know who he is and he does that by his spirit and through his word and he did that in the greatest way through the sending of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ to us and that is a wonderful thing. And if you aren't thankful for anything else today, you should be thankful for that. In light of that, it's appropriate that, uh, that each time we gather together, we look at his word and what he has revealed of himself to us. And this morning, we continue to look at the seven letters uh, to the seven churches in Revelation uh, as we work through the book of Revelation. And this morning, we are looking at the fourth one, the church at Thyatira, and that will be in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 18 and ending in verse 29. So Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 through 29, where the scripture says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold. I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am the one, I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over, over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this time where we hear from your word, help us to take it in. Help us to discern the truth. Help us to receive your word, accept it, submit to it, and live by it. Lord, give us open ears and open hearts. And let us ever be grateful and always be thankful for the fact that you have indeed given us your word. And as the one whom you've set aside to preach this morning, I pray that you would give me the words, 
And I ask that you would keep me from doing harm to your word in any way. And may your glory be shown this morning in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we've worked through these letters, um, there are always statements at the beginning about who the one is who is uh, initiating the letter, who is initiating the word, and that is Jesus Christ. And then there are statements typically about positive aspects of the church. And then there are statements about what the Lord uh, is concerned about within the church. And then there are statements calling people to repentance. And then statements about rewards for those who are faithful, for those who are overcome, for those who persevere in the faith. And that is true with the letter to Thyatira as well. Starts by saying that the uh, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. So the one who is speaking this word is first of all the Son of God which is interesting because the Lord Jesus Christ does not use this title for himself typically. Typically he uses the title for himself Son of Man. But in this context he uses the title Son of God because he's wanting to stress the fact that the one who is speaking these words of them is not just simply a savior or a prophet, but he is in fact God himself. He is divine. He is the son of God. Therefore, these words must be taken with the utmost seriousness. He is the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. We've seen this before. The eyes like a flame of fire uh, give a picture of one who has eyes that penetrate to the very heart of the one he is speaking to and looking at. So the church at Thyatira who is receiving this letter are receiving this letter from the one who is God. He is the son of God and he sees to the very heart of who they are with those eyes that are like fire and he is the one who is the strong one who has feet like burnished bronze, who is on the foundation that cannot be shaken. In other words, he has all power. He is omniscient. He knows and sees everything. And he is the one that they need to take more seriously than anyone else. And that's who this letter is coming from. So right out of the gate, once again, we have an indication to those who are reading the letter at Thyatira some 2,000 years ago, not quite 2,000 years ago at this point in time, and for us who are in the church, who this letter has been preserved for us throughout these uh, 1,900 and some odd years, for our intake and for our edification, we need to understand that when we read this particular letter, as in the, uh, as the other letters as well, we need to recognize that this is words from the living God so they are to be taken seriously verse 19 says I know your works your love and faith and service and patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first this is a good church this is a church that is loving this is a church that is faithful this is a church that is endured this is a church that, that demonstrates good works and demonstrates its faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ by committing good works. Uh, this is a solid church in many, many ways. Uh, this is a church that if someone was to walk into off the street, they would think of most likely as a place that they would want to be, as a group of people that they would want to, that they would want to be around because this is a church who is loving and faithful and service oriented. And if you walk in off the street into a church, what do you want to see typically? Well, one of the first things you will always get uh, as a response in a positive situation from a visitor into a church is that they sense a, a sense of love in the air, faithfulness in the air, these type of things. They were friendly. They were nice. They were welcoming. Well, you get that from a church like the church at Thyatira. 
They, the Lord knows their love, their faith, and their service, and their patient endurance. This is a church that any one of us, if we walked in off the street, would think to ourselves, this place has it going on. This is a good place to be. And the Lord commends them for these things. And he says, you have done well in these areas. And that is to be commended. He even says, your latter works exceed the first. In other words, they're, they're growing in love. They're growing in works. They're growing in faithfulness. They're growing in service. They're doing better than they did when they first started. And we always want to be a part of a church that does better as it goes along as opposed to does the opposite. So Thyatira, from many aspects and many angles, is pictured here as a church that is doing well. But the Lord does have something that he has to deal with them on, as he does the other churches as well. And that is this, verse 20, But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. They tolerate a woman called Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is enticing people within the church to sexual immorality and to uh, uh, eat food sacrificed to idols. So the, enticing them into idolatry. Now, who is this woman Jezebel? First of all, uh, because of the nature of the literature that we're dealing with, it is, it is very possible that the term Jezebel is, is talking about uh, a spirit that's among a group of people in the church. I don't think that's the best way to take this, but that is a possibility. There's also a possibility that the term Jezebel is being used to describe a, sp a particular woman or group of women who think of themselves as prophetesses, and, but act in a way that Queen Jezebel did in ancient Israel as depicted in 1 Kings. Uh, Queen Jezebel was the, the queen of King Ahab and she led the people of Israel uh, very forcefully to worship the Baal prophets and, and the, the gods of Baal and led the people astray into all sorts of horrible things. So it could be a term used to describe a woman or a group of women. But I personally think that even though those are options, I actually think that what's being given to us is the name of an actual woman who is claiming to be a prophetess in the church at Thyatira. I think it's a woman who's named Jezebel. And she is someone who claims for herself authority in speaking for the Lord that has not been granted to her by the Lord or acknowledged to be given to her by the body of Christ as a whole and particularly by the apostles. What did we read over in 2 Peter chapter 1 earlier? Devin read it for us. Devin Leach read it for us. I'm going to read it again here real quick for just a second, or at least part of it. Uh, in verse 16, Peter says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter, speaking for himself and for the apostles. And this letter, 2 Peter, would have been written about 20, 25 years before the revelation is given. Peter's already dead at the time the revelation's given. But he is saying that the message of the apostles is not a message that we, we came upon of our own doing. We actually saw the Lord. We followed the Lord. We were, uh, were eyewitnesses to what he did. And he's the one who set us aside as the foundation of the church. We didn't do that. He did it. And then he goes on further on, down in verse 19 of the same chapter. It says, and we have something more, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Notice that. No prophecy of Scripture. What do you mean by that? Nothing that is truly from the Lord, nothing that is truly 
worthy of the Word of God, nothing that is truly worthy of being called Scripture comes from one's own interpretation, comes from oneself. Verse 21, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. So man doesn't come up with the word of God. The word of God and the proclamation of God and the giftings that God gives to his church in people who are uh, called in, in the New Testament era, New Testament prophets or New Testament apostles or people who are called uh, uh, pastor teachers or, or even called into missionary work or who are called uh, in evangelism, these sorts of things. They only speak the things that they speak based upon the authority that is granted them by God and through his word. Period. And if anyone comes up with a message that is contrary to the teachings of the word of God, you can rest assured, you can take it to the bank that it is not of God. We don't get to decide what we are within the body of Christ. God does this. And the church recognizes this. And the word of God declares this. What Peter is saying in that section over there in 2 Peter is, I didn't choose to be an apostle. I didn't come up with this message, neither did any of the other apostles. But God is the one who spoke through us. God is the one who set us apart. God is the one who gave us the prophetic message. And that is the only way, ultimately, that anything we say has any kind of authority in the first place. And if it doesn't line up with, with the other things that the Lord has had declared through his word, through his people, through prophets, through preachers, through apostles, then throw it out. Simple as that. In Thyatira, over in Revelation, this church that is full of love, full of faith, full of service, growing in these things, doing very well, has allowed this one woman who, as the text says, calls herself a prophetess to lead people away from the things of God. And now the Lord Jesus Christ is dealing with that church because of the fact that they have allowed this to happen and they haven't dealt with it. He has given time, it says, in, in verse 21, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. In other words... I've given this woman time to repent of the things that she is speaking. I've given her time to turn away from this view that she has portrayed that she is somehow speaking for God when in fact she's not. She's a self-appointed prophetess. I've given her time to repent of the sexual immorality that she's committing and leading others to commit. Of the idolatry that she's committing and leading others to commit. And I've also implicit in that text, I've also given the church at Thyatira time to deal with it. But now it's time for me to deal with it because you haven't dealt with it. You notice the similarity in all these letters? I mean, we've dealt with four of them so far and you have a lot of crossover going on, don't you? You've got issues where you've got churches that have great positives about them, but there might be one thing that is a negative, but the one thing is such a big negative that the Lord God has to deal with it. And he gives the church's time in all these circumstances, all these letters, to deal with the negatives that they have. But ultimately, he declares that he will take care of the situation. And there will be judgment in the church, and there will be judgment on the individuals who are committing the things that he is addressing to the church. We saw that very clearly in Pergamum. We saw it in Ephesus. And we're seeing it here in Thyatira. This woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Look, there are people who rise up from within the church 
And always remember this. This woman is a part of this church. She has risen up from this church. And while many of them are serving in love and faithfulness and, and goodness and service and even right thinking, and she's been a part of that, but somehow she has gone astray as she has gone down the, the road, I don't doubt for a second that she has heard some sort of voice that has told her that she is to be a prophetess. The problem is people who are searching for voices and, and are searching for those type of mystical experiences typically find them, but they aren't from God. Now, can God speak to someone? Absolutely. Absolutely God can speak to someone. But is it the norm that God speaks to someone? No, it's not. God speaks to people through his word. And God reveals his word to people through the Holy Spirit. He's typically, in this age in particular, not in the business of speaking audibly to individuals. For this woman to claim to be a prophetess, she probably got some sort of a word telling her that she is a prophetess. And she starts teaching things that are incorrect. What are the things she's teaching? She's teaching people that it is okay, much like at the church at Pergamum, it is okay to be sexually immoral and still claim to be a Christian. In other words, it's okay to be involved in prostitution and, and fornication and adultery and all these sorts of things and still claim to be a Christian. And she's leading people to eat food sacrificed to idols, idolatry. These are the two things that are most closely associated to false religions sexual immorality and some form of idolatry particularly regarding meals and she's involved in this as well and she's fallen prey into this libertine liberal licentious way of thinking and she thinks that she's speaking for the Lord in telling people that this is okay and she's actually leading people astray who are within the church and they are committing these same sins as she believes are, are correct to commit and she is driving people to their deathbed as opposed to to the Lord. A false prophet will always lead people away from the Lord. A false prophet will always lead people away from the scripture, from the word of God. Now, at the time that this is written, the time that this is getting, or you're given I should say all of scripture has been written with the exception of this so the church at Thyatira would have had access to the entire Old Testament and basically all of the New Testament so they would have very easily been able to look at the letters of Paul, the letters of Peter uh, even the Gospels and been able to see that the things that Jezebel was teaching were incorrect and there may have been many who did that. But they allowed her to go on in her false teaching and that can't be done in a healthy church. It just simply can't be tolerated. The Lord is saying once again to these seven churches, ultimately, I am the Lord of the church and you will do things the way I say to do them or you're going to have to answer to me. My word is preeminent in the church, the Lord Jesus says. You will adhere to my word or you will answer to me. We have to take that seriously because if we fall prey the idea that the false prophetess comes up with or the false prophet comes up with that, that somehow we have the ability to speak words that are just as powerful as the word of God then we are going down the wrong track and we're heading towards, towards destruction we have to be people who adhere to the book who adhere to the word and who Worship the God, the Lord of that word, the Lord Jesus Christ above all things. 
He says in verse 22, Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. I think, I think he would take this children probably to mean the spiritual offspring that are happening because of the false teachings that she is teaching. In other words, God will judge in such a way that he will bring great trial and tribulation to her and, and sickness to her, to those who cohabitate with her, who follow her teachings, and ultimately he will bring death to those who adhere to these teachings. He will destroy the one who follows the false prophetess. Kind of makes it important to follow the right things, right? Kind of makes it important to follow first of all the Lord Jesus, second of all the Lord Jesus as he's revealed in his word, and third of all, the apostles who's he, who he has appointed as the foundation of the church, right? Kind of makes it important then to know your word. Because if you are allowing false teaching and things that are contrary to the word of God within the context and confines of the body, and people are being led astray into sin because of that, you're just crying out for the judgment of God. Let it never be said of us that we fall prey to the false teachings of man. But let it always be said of us that we adhere and cling to the Christ of creation, the Christ of salvation, and the word that reveals him to us in every way. I will strike her children dead in verse 23. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you as your works deserve. In bringing judgment to Jezebel and all those associated with Jezebel, the Lord will reveal himself as the one who searches the mind and the heart. He's the only one who can give a prophetic word. He's the only one who speaks ultimate truth. And he's the only one who knows everything about everybody. He's the one who searches the mind and the heart. And in judging these people, in bringing death to these people, he will demonstrate that even though they may look like followers of Christ on, from the outside and even maybe to some of those who are within the church, by the judgment that he cast upon them, he will demonstrate he knows who his true followers are and who the false ones are. And he brings death and destruction and judgment upon those who are the false ones because he is the one who searches the mind and searches the heart. And he will give, I will give to each of you as your works deserve. This is not a statement addressed to save people. I repeat that. When Jesus says, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve, he is not addressing this to save people. Look at the context. He's talking about the judgment that's being meted out. He's talking about striking children, the, the, the children dead of Jezebel and, and the church knowing who searches the mind and heart because he's the one who sees who's true and who's false. And giving to each of you as your works deserve is a statement addressed to those who are within the church but who aren't true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they aren't actually born again. They aren't actually covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are still under the wrath of God. They are deceived by the false prophetess. And they are led astray by their own desires to do what they will do as opposed to what the Lord would have them to do. And he will give to them as their works deserve. Now, no one in their right mind wants God to give them what they deserve. No one in their right mind wants God to give them what their works deserve. No one in their right mind wants God to give them what their thoughts deserve. Why? Because we are all, by nature, our very nature, under the wrath of God. Children of wrath. We are all, by our very nature, enslaved to sin. Therefore, what we deserve according to our works is the judgment of God. 
and no one in their right mind wants the judgment of God placed upon them. And what Jesus is saying to the church at Thyatira is Jezebel and all those who are led astray by her, who cohabitate with her, all her uh, ultimate spiritual children, the children that come about through all of this, are going to re, uh, reap the, uh, the, the judgment of God and he will give them what they deserve. He will give them destruction. And that's a horrible thing for anyone to contemplate who understands what it means to be in the hands of a holy God. We don't want what we deserve. And if we think we deserve something more than the judgment of God, we miss what it means to be a follower of Christ altogether. Because the only thing we deserve is the judgment of God. Because left to ourselves, we will follow ourself. We will follow false gods. We will make something out of God that he is not. We will warp God and we will warp everything it means to be holy. Paul speaks about this very clearly in Romans chapter 1. He says that every man knows in their heart that there's a God. But left to themselves, every man will ultimately end up worshiping the creature as opposed to the creator. Every man knows that there's a God in their heart because they can look in the universe and look in the creation and they can tell this didn't happen by chance. But apart from the gospel, apart from the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, apart from the Holy Spirit being active in that gospel message, every person who may start with the, the desire to know who God is will end up warping who that God is and make God into his own image. He will worship the creature as opposed to the creator. We are all like that. and We are all destined for the wrath of God apart from the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Jesus is saying to the church at Thyatira is for these people who are following Jezebel, who are following the false prophet, they're not going to receive grace. They're going to receive what they deserve unless they repent. Unless they repent. But there is a positive aspect to this. Verse 24 forward. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, uh, this term, the deep things of Satan, was closely associated with some of the false teachings that were going on uh, in that day. Some of the, the ancient Near Eastern mythical religions and mystical, I should say, religions of the day. Uh, were, were referred to as the deep things of Satan. This is something, in other words, that Jezebel would be teaching as if it's from God, but the reality is it's from Satan. Someone saying, standing up in a pulpit and saying, it is perfectly okay to live sexually immoral lives and yet follow the Lord Jesus Christ, that is not a teaching of God, and they think it's some sort of deep, enlightened way of thinking, but the truth is, it's a thing of Satan is what the Lord Jesus is saying. He says, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. As when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have, have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says, if you remain faithful, if you hold to what you've been taught, if you keep my works until the end, and you, you, you keep following me, you don't fall prey to false teachings, you cling to the word of God, you cling to the Christ of the cross, you cling to the Christ who's revealed through the apostles by his word, then... You are the one who will conquer until the end. And then he repeats or he brings into the equation Psalm chapter 2. Let me read Psalm chapter 2. I should have marked it, but I didn't. Psalm chapter 2. 
says this. I'm going to start in verse 1, even though the, the text that we're dealing with are really in verses 7, 8, and 9. Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, <clears throat> Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As of, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. It's a psalm about a coming king that the Lord will establish in Zion who will be the one who will rule. And ultimately, the one who fulfills this is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, using that psalm in this context, applies it not just to himself, but to those who overcome the false teachings of this world and the sin of this world, to those who remain faithful in the Lord Jesus Christ. He applies this psalm to them, even though the psalm actually applies to the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that those who are in Christ are promised by Christ himself that while he rules and reigns in the new heavens and new earth, while he rules and reigns in that millennial kingdom, those who are in Christ and those who are with him and those who are faithful will rule and reign with him. And they will receive the morning star. Morning star can mean several different things, but I think in this context, it's the same as what it means in 2 Peter which is most likely they will receive Christ and what it means to be a genuine follower and a genuine brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will be set up along with the Lord Jesus Christ as the ones who rule and reign over the new heavens and the new earth. Christ being the head, but we as his body being the ones who are the stewards under his headship in the new heavens and the new earth. What a glorious thing that is. See, Jesus, in saving you, doesn't just promise you heaven where you're floating around in the clouds and playing a harp. Jesus promises you a position in the new heavens and the new earth, ruling and reigning alongside him over creation. And the fulfillment of what God commanded of man in Genesis chapter 1 will finally, ultimately take place. What he commanded in Genesis chapter 1. He said that man, Adam, <clears throat> is to be the one who has stewardship and he is the one who is sovereign ultimately over the created order. But man fell. And now in the new heavens and new earth, because of what Christ has done, man rules and reigns again in a proper way. And the earth is subdued by man because of the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all those who are in him will rule and reign with him in the new heavens and the new earth. you got a position of royalty, in other words. So he's not just simply promising heaven. He's promising heaven exalted, if you will. He will rule them with a rod of iron, verse 27, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. In other words, the one who is faithful to him will receive authority to rule in the same way that the Son received authority from the Father, the Son will give authority to those who follow him. Verse 29, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, this is a word from God. Are you listening? This is a word from God. Are you paying attention? This is a word from God. Take it seriously. Because it means something. It means something. Folks, there are many sitting in the pews today who profess the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior but have never grasped what it really means to, to be a child of the King and don't fully understand what it means 
that one day those who are faithful to him, those who are true followers of him, those who have truly been born again are not just going to be in heaven but are going to rule alongside him in heaven. He's the ruler, but we rule alongside him. And scripture says that we will even judge angels and all the created beings of the universe will be under the authority of the God-man and those who are associated with the God-man, us. You are being made follower of Christ into a kings and queens because of him. But there may be people in the pews today and I'm not speaking into anyone's life. I don't know where your heart is. It's not for me to say. I don't have that right. But there may be people in the pews today who claim the name of Jesus but are really following Jezebel. And there may be people in the pews today who love the idea of heaven and love the idea of Jesus love the idea of no more pain no more suffering no more sorrow all that good stuff but they're living their lives for themselves and in essence they're following Jezebel if you're one of those people you need to repent the Lord has not brought judgment yet the judgment's coming because if you're one of those people who claims the name of Christ but you're really living for yourself that means you're not living for Christ which means you're not really a Christian and you may have walked the aisle and you may have been baptized and you may have been put on church roll but you're not saved and our churches are full of them throughout the country the one who is truly saved will remain and will remain faithful see the church at Thyatira didn't have a problem with believers who were falling away they had a problem in that they had a church full of believers and they had a church full of unbelievers that looked like believers and they were falling away and they weren't really falling away they were just demonstrating who they really were because when a false teaching came they fell for it because this false teaching offered uh, freedom of the flesh Are you living for yourself? Are you following Jezebel? Are you living for Christ? Only you can answer that. But that's the question that lingers in the air. The ones who are living for Christ, who have truly been born again, who have truly been saved, will never lose that salvation and will one day rule in the new heavens and the new earth alongside Jesus but the ones who are following Jezebel will one day even though they may look like they're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ they know deep down where they really stand and you can fool men but you can't fool God because he's the one who searches the heart and searches the mind and one day they will be the ones who receive what they deserve and no one in their right mind wants to receive what they deserve from God. As we come to the time of our hymn of invitation, which is softly and tenderly this morning, as true it comes, the leaders and the ladies come to play for us. That's the question in the air. Are you following Christ or are you following Jezebel? You need to go to the Lord and you need to find out the answer. You may know the answer right off the bat. If you're a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to know the answer right off the bat. But if it's something that's uh, tugging at your heart, you may need to get something cleared up. You may be a follower of Christ who's just not quite doing exactly what you ought to do at this point in time and there's conviction there and you know you need to repent. But you need to seriously ask the question before the Lord in the presence of his Holy Spirit and the reading of his word who am I following and if you find the answer is I'm following Jezebel I'm living for myself 
then there's a way to remedy that. The Lord Jesus Christ lived a perfect life for us because we can't do it because we are by nature children of wrath and enslaved to our sin. He lived a perfect life that we couldn't live so that he would be the representative for us before God the Father. And then he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. And while he was dying on the cross, God the Father poured out his wrath upon our sin on Jesus. And the scripture says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Don't take that scripture lightly. If you confess with your mouth means you're open about it. You openly follow Jesus. You aren't ashamed of it. You're not a closet Christian. You are willing to serve him, follow him, be faithful to him. He is your Lord and Savior. You confess it with your mouth. And believe with your heart means more than just simply understanding in your mind. Look, Satan knows the doctrine of the Christology of, uh, of Jesus better than any of us yet he doesn't submit to the Lord Jesus willingly. The demons know what it means to be saved, but they don't submit to the Lord willingly. They understand who Jesus is better than us, but they don't follow him. To believe with your heart that God is raising him from the dead means you believe with your whole being and you're willing to give yourself over to him. And the, one, the believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead means you, be, you are giving yourself over to the one that is revealed to us by God as the one way to be saved, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ who was raised from the dead for our eternal life. And if there's anybody here who when you answer the question, am I following Jesus or Jezebel, and you come up with the answer Jezebel, then the only solution is bow the knee to Jesus, and he will save you. Stand with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we will sing softly and tenderly. And if there's any decision that needs to be made, the, the invitation is open. You can come speak with me. If you need me to pray with you, I'm more than willing to. If you need to pray where you are, that's fine as well. But whatever the Lord would have you do, however he would have you respond, do it earnestly and do it quickly. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you for your goodness and for your grace, for your word, for your salvation, for your mercy. Thank you for giving us mercy as opposed to judgment, as opposed to what we deserve, Lord God. Lord, you sent your son to live for us and to die for us. We didn't deserve it. And we praise you for that. We can never repay you for that. But we can submit to you because of that. If there be any in this room who need to know the salvation that's offered in Jesus Christ, I pray that they would know it today pray that we would be honest when we ask the question are we following Jesus or Jezebel and that we would respond honestly as well have your way with us and may you be glorified in us in Jesus name I pray amen I